Okay, like it's already 9.05, I think we can just start very slowly. Okay, we start our class today with al Fatiha. So I will be recording this session and then you can, uh, I will upload it on YouTube. So you can watch it anytime if you want to do some kind of revision. Yeah, our lecture last week on, uh, on uh, post-positive hysteria also, I have already uploaded online, okay? All right, so today we will proceed, okay. we will proceed with a new topic. We will discuss about critical and cultural theory, okay? So most probably we will only be discussing critical this today and then we will continue with cultural next week, okay? So um, I think we've already discussed all the four main categories of theories, okay? We talked about post-positivist last week and then we've already discussed normative theory, okay? So like I've mentioned many times, okay, there are thousands of theories in social sciences, and in communication, so it's impossible for us to know all of them, okay? But we must know the four main cate categories, okay? Because most of these theories are under one of these categories, okay? And normative theory, as you know, is very simple. It talks about the uh, ideal way of understanding media, okay? And how media should be managed. So it takes a very macro look at the relationship between media and public, media and uh, the industry. Okay. On the other hand, we've also discussed post-positivist theory. Okay. Some call it media effects. Okay. It's called post-positivist because it's an extension of positivism. Okay. I've already also discussed what is positivism in the first lecture. All right, positivism is the idea of scholarship that is very scientific. That when we want to make a relationship or any assumption, okay, it is based on scientific evidence. Scientific means, okay, it uses prof proper methods. And then it also uh, uses uh, what we call it methods that can be proved. Okay, and because of it, okay, it's more related to science. It's hard for us in social science to be 100% positivist. So that's why we consider ourselves post-positivist. That means beyond positivism because we also use methods, we try to be scientific, but when we analyze or interpret our data, okay, usually okay, it cannot be too scientific or mathematical because we're dealing with human, rela human relationships. Okay? So you already seen all these examples of theories like two-step flow, okay, um, attitude change theory. All of these are examples of post-positivist theory. Okay, and so these theories, as you can see, they are very systematic. That means they just don't just make assumption; they explain in detail, step by step. Okay, why? Because they want to be scientific. Because they want to say that whatever relationship that they are trying to prove, okay, it is made via proper method. And the idea of post-positivism is that humans are generally, uh, you know, part of a big system. So when we talk about media, we're only studying one part of this system. So we cannot make big assumptions, okay? like normative theory, making big, assum big assumptions. Okay? So today we're going to uh, go into another important category, the critical cultural. Okay? Why do we combine? Because they are related. Okay, cultural theories are part of critical theory. So critical theory is the pioneer or the origin, right? Okay, so critical theory, as you will see later on, okay, it is actually trying to, uh, it's quite an, the opposite of post-positivism in some ways. Not total opposite, okay? But what it, try, it strives to do, okay, or try to explain is very different from post-positivism, okay? So I hope that introduction can refresh you a bit about what we have been start studying. So I will share with you the um, slides, yeah? Am I already presenting? Are my slides on? Hello? My slides are on already. Is no. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought I yeah. have it. All right. Yes, okay, one. thank uh, you for okay. the response. Okay. So, these are the learning objectives. Okay. I will not go through them. All right. You can uh, go through them on your own. 
the thing with learning objectives is if you are able um, at the end of the course, okay, at the end of the lecture, if you want to know whether you have learned enough or you have understood, you look back at here and see if you understand what we mean by all of these objectives, okay? All right. So here we start with the idea of critical theory. In social science, we claim that the main idea is critical theory. But actually, later on, you will know that this theory okay, is, originates from the idea of Karl Marx or Marxism. Okay? But because we don't really want in the scholarship to be considered Marxist or supporting communism, for example, okay, so we consider ourselves critical theory because we adopt the idea, but we're not really adopting communism or socialism. Okay? So critical theories are theories that openly espouse certain values and using these values to evaluate and criticize the status quo. Uh, the term here is very important. They espouse certain values. And here you can see that it's already very different from post-positivism. Why? Because post-positivism talks about being positivist, being scientific, which means you have to be object objective. All right, you cannot be putting your values or your emotions into your research. Okay? But on the other hand, critical theory starts off by saying we are espousing. That means we are fighting for a certain value. So this theory starts off being biased. Okay, critical theory. Because they have a specific intent, intention. And these values are meant to criticize the status quo. Okay? Providing alternate ways of interpreting the social role of mass media. Okay, they have values they like or don't like. Okay, for example, when we are going to uh, evaluate certain media content, okay, okay, through Islamic perspective, uh, we've already a certain we've already adopted certain va certain values, and when we want to evaluate, for example, Western content via Islamic perspective. Obviously, we will be commenting or criticizing, okay, because it's against our own bad, our own values. And most of the time, what critical theory is trying to challenge is the status quo, okay? What do we mean by the status quo? Okay, when I discuss later on, I will probably be referencing to the Western media most of the time, to the American media, okay? Why the West? Why America? Because when in terms of media and technology, they are the status quo. Status quo in this sense is those who have the power, who have the power. Or those who, uh, what we call it, define okay, the culture, okay, define the, uh, what we call it, trademark, not trademark, the benchmark. Okay? So status quo, but you must understand, is not really about the rich or the elites or the West. Okay? I'm supposed to close the dialogue for someone wants to join. Hold on, yeah. What dialogue? I did not switch on any dialogue. It's okay. I don't know who's that. All right, now can you join? Okay. Hold on, yeah. Okay. Good morning, Masum and Alia. Okay, we're discussing about um critical theory. Okay. So going back here, status quo, okay? So this term, this word status quo is very impo important, okay? Because you will see when we study critical and cultural theory, it's all about trying to challenge the status quo. Again, the status quo is anyone or any organization or institution that has the power, okay, in that power relationship. So it doesn't mean at the, uh, it's only the elites, the rich, the government, the West, the Americans, no. Because in any environment or in any situation, there will be a status quo. For example, when we talk about Malaysia, Islam is the status quo. Okay, the Malays are the status quo. Okay, so sometimes we're not always the victim. Sometimes we are the status, we are the status quo. Okay, so it depends, all right? So this critical theory, okay, they believe okay, that everything, okay, it's not just the media, okay, in every aspect of life, there will be some groups that wants to maintain the status quo. 
That means they want to dominate another, another group. Okay, and with regard to media, they use the mass media to, domi to dominate. Okay, why do they have these beliefs, okay, values and uh, status quo? And in terms of power relations, because again, this theory originates from the idea of Marxism. Okay, so this theory in general, okay, is politically based. Politics here, again, is not just about governments and elections. Politics is about power relations. Okay, the politics of the Malays, the politics of the Muslims. Okay, the Malays in this country, for example, will always try to maintain their status, status quo. Okay? So this theory is action-oriented. Why? Because when they set, okay, whoever adopts this theory, when they set into doing the research, they already have a value. They want to criticize, they want to comment, and they want to change the status, status quo. Okay, so the action is changing the status, status quo. Okay, and they use theory and research to plan change in the real world. Okay, and they ask big important questions. Uh, this is again opposite of post-positivism. Okay, the post-positivism post is inductive. Remember, we've already used the word inductive. Okay, it studies a small phenomenon and then it tries to make some kind of a relationship. On the other hand, okay, critical theory is deductive. Okay, that means it starts from big to small. Okay, it talks about the relationship between those in power and those that is less powerful. And then it tries to explain. For example, okay, they can ask, okay, why is it um, um, the... Your Malay neighbor, okay, is, um, for example, they can uh, question, okay, the education uh, level of the Malays in Malaysia, okay. But before they answer the education level question, they've already made the assumption, oh, because the Malays are the status quo, okay. But what is the weakness, okay, the weakness of this theory, it is sometimes too political, all right, because uh, this one is um, in, in the defense of post-positivism, okay? Because they lack scientific verification. They don't use proper method like positivism, okay? When you say big assumptions, okay, the impact of the uh, American media, okay, or how the Americans are discriminating other people, most of these things are quite subjective because it's big relationship that is hard to pinpoint. Okay? That's why, okay, when subjected, when people ask okay, they, that critical theory must be scientific, they often employ this controversial research methods. That means the methods that they use are usually qualitative. And the problem with qualitative, it's hard to defend because you're making assumptions but you, most of the time, do not uh, support it with scientific methods, okay? For example, if you take post-positivism, you suggest a relationship, you can prove it via your survey results. You went down and did the survey. But with critical theory, usually it's very hard because you're making big assumptions, okay? The influence of Western media on the Muslims. There are so many Muslims, how to survey all of them? Okay. Now, this is another important uh, factor that you must understand. Okay, because when we talk about critical theory later on, you will see that this theory has developed. Okay, it has evolved. It started off from the idea of communism, which is very hardcore, very extreme. Okay, and today you will see that it has moved into a culturalist view. Okay, so why is there this change in this theory? Because there is a different way of understanding the communication process. How we see communication, how we see media transforming or transporting informa information. There are two ways, okay? The first is transmissional and the second is ritual. Now, transmissional is a traditional way of understanding the communication process. Okay, what do we mean? Okay, maybe some of you are aware of the traditional uh, communication process from the sender to the receiver. 
is very mechanical, is very direct. It assumes that in all information that comes from the source will be received by the uh, receiver. Okay, that means information is done direct. So whoever is the source, okay, can give specific information that will be adopted by the audiences or the public. This is transmit transmission. On the other hand, okay, some argue that the communication process is not transmissional. It's not that direct. That communication process or understanding messages is actually a ritual perspective. Okay? Ritual means what? Okay, ritual is mean by your doing. Okay? It views of mass communication as the representation of shared belief where reality is produced, maintained, repaired, and transformed. Now, what does this mean? Okay? It means here okay, that this perspective argue communication or the transmission of uh, the movement of information and messages is not direct. It's not just from sender to receiver. Because from the sender to reach the receiver, there are many other processes or systems in, be in between. Okay? I give you an example. Okay? Us being Muslims, okay? where do we get our information? Okay, Alice, where do you get your information about being good Muslims? Hmm? Alice left. <laughs> okay. So, for being a Muslim, okay, usually we learn from the Quran. Okay, or we learn from our ustas. Okay, we learn from the hadith. Now, if communication is transmissional, that means, okay, the message from the Quran the transmit a message from the uh, ustas will go direct to the Muslims. Then in general, <clears throat> all the Muslims would be good Muslims, right? Because you get the same, me same message. Very direct, very direct. Okay? And here, when we talk about transmission perspective, okay, the process of transmitting messages from a distance for the purpose of control. Yes, the Quran, the Hadith, the Usta, that is the that desire to control, to control the Muslims, okay, to make sure that they behave, that they become good, Mus good Muslims. But how come most of us are not really that perfect Muslims? Because we learn, okay, messages, we take messages, not only directly, but also through the rituals. Rituals mean it's part of our everyday life. Okay, yes, okay, we go to the religious school, we learn from the ustas, we read the Quran. But when we get home, okay, then we see our parents, for example, they don't pray. Okay, they don't pray, I don't know, they don't practice what is being taught. So what we learn about Islam is not just coming from the Quran, but also by watching our, pa our parents. Okay. And then we also learn going to school or the friends, okay? Some friends pray differently. So in your interpretation of being a Muslim, have your interpretations of being a Muslim has been influenced, okay? By your life experiences. Can you understand? Okay? So being a Muslim is not that direct. Okay? It can be produced, but it can be maintained and it can change. It depends on your everyday experiences. Isn't it right? So that's why, okay, the the way the uh, what Muslims practice their religion in Pakistan is different from Bangladesh, different from Indonesia, different from Malaysia. Okay, because our religion has been influenced by our culture. Okay, and that is an example of ritual perspective. Perspective that means communication process. Okay, is not just direct. It is a representation of our experiences and because of that the message that we get and our understanding of a particular message can change through time okay so there is two ways to understand communication process okay now the original critical theory because they adopt the idea of marxism they adopt this what we call as transmit transmissional okay that's why they're very extreme they think Okay, that those in power is very powerful and those that is powerless is easily influenced. Okay, because the message is that direct. Okay. <clears throat> so an example, okay, of a very 
powerful critical theory is a political economy theory because this theory study elite control of economic institutions such as banks and stock markets and then show how this control affects many other social institutions including the mass media okay so this is a subset of a of a critical theory and it also adopts a transmissional uh, perspective because okay but what is unique about this theory is that it specifically studies how elites or the status quo control economic and political institutions okay so this theory argues those who are already in power the status quo the elites maybe in some countries the government or the rich people okay they will always be rich they will always maintain the status quo okay because they've already controlled the economy and political institutions and when they control the economic and political institutions okay they will try to control the social institutions okay what does this mean okay we can talk about like i said american me american media okay why are we all mostly watching american media okay despite of us being muslims and having different backgrounds okay some of us from africa some of us from the middle east but we all watch american content and american media because the americans are already controlling the economic institutions okay because the americans are the one who has the money the power and the ability to organize and create big media production big media cup big media company okay when we talk about netflix for example do you see any local competitor to Netflix? Of course, all right. You have in Malaysia, you have Astrobo, okay, and then you have other brands like Hulu, okay. But the thing is, how big is Netflix? Netflix is very, very big, isn't it? Okay, and Netflix can offer thousands of content. So, as a media consumer, which would you choose? The local company, okay, the local provider that can only offer you 100 TV content or Netflix that's much cheaper and can offer you 10,000 content. So because they are already powerful in that sense, they will always maintain the status, status quo. Okay? I hope you understand this. Alright? And when they control the status quo, they control the content political, economically, okay, they are able to control other things as well. They can control our social lives. They can control our cultural lives. Okay? For example, what? The way we dress, what we eat. All of that is already dependent on what we watch on TV. And what we watch on TV is coming from America. Can you understand? So it means because they already have the control of the political and economic institutions, they use it to maintain the power, maintain the power. Okay, so that we will always be less, okay, so that they can maintain the status quo. They are the powerful, we are the power, powerless. Alright, so political economy is a very popular theory because we use it to explain, for example, globalization, okay. So what are the strengths, okay? It focuses on how media are structured and controlled. Okay. Now, if you use this theory, you will see later on that all of these media companies, okay, they are already part of a bigger company. They are always conglomerates. That means the media industry is usually okay, controlled by a bigger company. And because they are very big, they can control the whole indus industry. Okay. We can talk about Google, for example. How big is Google? Very, very big isn't it? Alright? Do you know of any other search engine other than Google? Okay. Emily? Are you there? Yes, madam. Do you use other search engine other than Google? No. No. Do you know Bing? Mm. No. 
usually we don't know okay and some of you may have probably come across bing and the first thing you search on bing is google isn't it to go back to google okay why is it that we are all very dependent on google because it's already very very big okay and very structured once google is big what else okay it buys off all the other competitors that's why you see google owns uh youtube google owns uh what is it that powers your uh, phone uh android okay that means it owns okay and it controls all of these technologies in your in your life okay so we if we don't have these researchers that criticize okay or study how big google is then we wouldn't know how they are controlling us okay so it does offer empirical investigation uh, this one okay you must realize okay just now we say that post positivism is more scientific and that critical theory is not that scientific but okay critical theory still okay they try to adopt some kind of methods okay to prove their assum assumptions okay so here, okay, they may be using methods such as documents, yeah, investigating documents, okay, uh, or analyzing or researching via interviews, okay. So those are the methods that are used in critical theory. So they seek to link between media content, media structure, and media finance finances. So this theory is very specific to look at economic, okay, influences of. Um, the status quo. Again, what are the weaknesses? You will see that the weaknesses are all mostly with regard to their math methods. Okay, and these they are the weaknesses of uh, polit uh, critical theory is often co uh, represented by the strength of post positivism. Okay, here they have little power, at explanatory power at the microscopic level. Okay, why? Okay, I mentioned just now, oh, Netflix lah, Google. Okay, Google is controlling the world. Okay, uh, Netflix is defining what everybody is watching. Okay, but it cannot explain, for example, okay, why uh, Masum, okay, is able to use Google, uh, to use YouTube, for example, to help the Muslims in a particular country and challenge the status quo, challenge his government. Because if you look at the theory in general, in macro, it says the social status quo, the elites will try to control you when you use all of their, uh, what we call it, materials, okay, like Google. But there are examples how individuals, okay, or small groups are able, okay, to challenge the status quo using the same techno technologies. And this is not explained by these theories, okay. So it is not concerned with causal explanation. Is based on subjective analysis of industry structure and finances. Okay, they are not really trying to make a relationship between the media and the audiences. Okay, specific group of audiences. They are focusing mostly on how these institutions okay exploit their finances and structures. Okay, so they are not concerned, like I mentioned just now, of how audiences respond to this content. Okay, they are not concerned. They are mostly concerned because the the, what their focus is already very specific, which is to look at the political economy structures of the media industries. Okay. Now, Marxist theory. All right, like I said just now, okay, in social science, we consider ourselves as adopting critical theory. Okay, we don't consider it Marxist because the term of Marxist is quite um controversial okay it's very much related to the idea of communism and socialism so these ideas of communism is quite controversial in academia okay you don't want to be labeled as a communist because if you're a communist it's as if you're intellectually challenged because you like to uh, have ideas that are limited you know if you're being a communist but okay in academia we also cannot deny Okay, that Marxist, okay, Karl Marx, communism have allowed us to see the world in a different way. Okay, Marxist, Karl Marx talks to us, tells us 
about status quo. It was Karl, Karl Marx's idea, okay, that everything in this world is actually trying to maintain that status, status quo. So, under critical theory, okay, there is still some who adopt Marxist. That means they are hardcore because they follow the specific ideas proposed by Karl Marx. Okay, because this theory argue that hierarchical class system is at the root of all social problems. Okay, now just now political economy, a critical theory that talks about the control of politics and economy. All right, but here when we talk about okay Marxist theory, it talks about how they criticize or they comment on hierarchical class system. Okay, what is a hierarchical class system? Like capitalism, the rich, the poor. Okay, all of us, we are part of a hierarchical class system, right? There's the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, all right? But in a communist community or society, okay, there isn't any hierarchical class system, isn't it? All right, communism, okay, promotes uh, what we call it sameness, okay? Uh, there's no class. Everybody is just the, just the same. Because communism argue, if there's no class, people won't fight. Because you and me, we all have the same amount of money. We all have the same amount of food on the table. Then everybody just the same. There's nothing to fight for. Okay? So that is why, actually, Marxism, because of the critique over hierarchical class system, they are, to they are totally opposite of capitalism. Okay? Because they believe, okay, when you create these hierarchies, people will have social pro social problems, which is quite true, right, in the societies that we live in. The poor are facing problems, okay, the poor are challenging the rich, okay, or the issues of Black Lives Matter is, for example, okay, later on we can discuss that, okay, is you can see it from this perspective, okay, through Marxist theory. Okay, but the nature of this theory is extreme. Because it says social class is the problem. Hierarchy is the problem. So we must end all this via revolution of the proletariat. Revolution means what? There must be abrupt change. Okay, so this theory proposed, okay, that whatever research you do, it must lead to some kind of a revolution. That you must challenge and then you must offer ways okay, to change this. So that's why we say here, for example, critical theory is very action-oriented, okay? But the word here is subtle in comparison to Marxist here that says it has to be a revolution. Revolution of the proletariat. Who's the proletariat? Okay? The ones who's not the status quo. Okay? They're usually the middle class and the bottom class. Okay? So here, if you take Marxist theory in relation... Okay, to media, you're going to basically criticize, okay, everything, okay, and according to this theory, okay, the three main ways, okay, status quo or the hierarchy controls the proletariats are through base, superstructure, and ideo ideology, okay. Base is what, okay, so in the times of communism, all right, Okay, and in the 60s especially, when this theory was very popular, okay, it was time of industrialization, right? Okay, so capitalism is all about modernity, it's all about industrialization. So there were lots of factories, okay, they were focusing more on the eco economy. So here they say, it's okay, those rich people, the West, the hierarchy, the status quo, they control they assert power because they have the means of production. They own, okay, all of these technologies, all of the economy, okay, all of the factories, okay. And not only that, they also own the superstructure. They own what is considered some kind of a society's culture, okay. What is a society's culture? Like the culture that we live in, okay, we can see that the rich, okay, define things, okay. And the rich tells us what to do. So we adopt this culture of the rich. Okay? Or, and also ideology. Okay? Ideas present in a culture that mislead average people and encourage them to act against their own interests. 
And because, all right, the status quo owns the base and superstructure, they can assert an ideology, okay? They will manage, okay? They will have some kind of a propaganda. They will define how we think about the world, okay? Wow, this can be quite confusing, right? Okay, so what this means? Now, I give you an example, okay, of the idea of, or the revolution of the Black Lives Matter. You know what's happening, right, in the US especially, okay? They are challenging the state, the white privilege, the white status quo. Now, you can understand this issue by taking a Marxist theory, okay? Because Marxists have already told us, okay, they've already told the black people, for example, okay, that... You know, you are being discriminated, okay, because you are, they are telling the American society that you are living in a hierarchy system where the white is being privileged, okay? Why are the white being privileged? Because they own the means of production. You know, in the American government, the American conglomerates, okay, they are all owned by the white people. How many black CEOs can you see? Okay, how many black presidents? Only one. And he's not that black also. Okay? And even if Obama was the president, you can see all of the parliament is full of white people. Okay? So they already own the base. And because they already own the base, they already own the culture. They set the culture of the society. What do we mean by they own this, uh, the culture of the society? Okay, so for example, okay, white people's culture, okay, they like, um, what are white people's culture, for example, okay, uh, the adoption of materialism, okay, how, capitalism, okay, American culture is capitalism. So those who are non-white, the American, uh, the black Americans, okay, the Asian Americans who are living there, Okay, they to adopt the same cul the same culture. Okay, they don't adopt their own culture, they adopt the white people's cul white people's culture. Okay, can you follow what I'm saying so far? All right, in Marxist theory, when we talk about here. Okay, so because, all right, they're trying to push, okay, these other minority groups to adopt their culture, this is the where the problem will arise. Okay, because the system... The American system, the government, the culture, the society, it is inherently white. Okay? What do we mean by what? Like I said just now, okay? Like going to the universities. What do they learn? Okay? They learn English literature. They learn English language. And when they learn about war and colonialism, they don't learn about what they did to other people. Okay? They define a history that privileges the white. So when, because they have this control, they are able to create an ideology, okay? They are able to tell the black people, you know what, okay? Whether you realize it or not, you are still the second, uh, second citizen. You are not the same as the white people, okay? So they have managed to create this ideo ideology. So that is why in a country like America, there is that, that tries to claim that they are very educated, intellectual, modern, they are very inherently, inherently still very, ra very racist because they already own the base and they own the superstructure. And when I mean they, okay, I'm referring to the white people. Okay? And through this, they create an ideo ideology that they are the better uh, group. So this is what is probably happening with the police who are... Uh, discriminating against the black because they too have adopted that ideo ideology. All right? And in Marxist theory, the problem with ideology is sometimes it misleads average people and encourage them to act against their own interests. Okay? That there are, for example, where the black people, okay, even they think they are less uh, intellectual, okay, that they think, okay, that the whites are better, that the whites are smarter. Can you understand? All right? So far? Okay? 
So this is the idea of Marxi, Marxism. Marxist theory, like I said, is very extreme, all right? It talks about revolu revolution. So that is why there is a very angry mob in the US because they want to end all of this via revolution. They want the change to happen now. They want the president to go, for example. They want to change the laws, the rules, the regulations. And if they want this to be done now, then they are looking for a revolu revolution. And what is happening has already been predicted by Marx, Karl Marx, via Marxist theory. Marxist theory. Okay? So if you're looking at the Black Lives Matter uh, phenomenon in the US, and you are able to uh, adopt, okay, or look at it, explain it via a theory, via Marxist theory. This is an example of how theory is used to explain real life events. Okay, and this is what we can consider, okay, a qualitative interpretive interpretation. Okay, so far, all right, we've talked about political economy, okay, we've talked about Marxism. So, you must realize for now, okay, all of these critical theories that I've discussed with you, they all adopt a transmissional approach. Here, Marxist theory, okay, it believes that information, okay, media, okay, are all owned by the status quo. And because they are owned by the status quo, the status quo can send out messages or content that will maintain their power, their power. Transmit, transmissional, okay? Now, the idea of political economy, Marxist theory, okay, it is very, uh, it's still in its original form. That means it's still the early ideas of Mar Marx, Karl Marx, okay? But the theory has evolved, okay? Now you can see, okay, that some theories have started to include the idea of cul culture in understanding status quo or in understanding power related power relations. Just now, when we study power relations and status quo, it's all about control, direct control via politics, via economy, okay, via structures. But now, okay, there are a group of uh, theorists that say actually control, power relations is more significant and effective when it is done through cul culture. Okay, what does this mean? Right, okay, so you must carefully be able to follow okay, the dynamic transition of uh, and development of critical theory. Just now we only say critical, now we say critical cultural. Okay, because they've changed a little bit the paradigm. Because now the paradigm says, eh, you know, the power relations, as you can see, the world has changed. Capitalism has won. Okay. The Americans or the white people are no longer controlling us by force, right? Okay. Yes, they are sending armies to some countries, but not all countries. Okay. There are, you cannot see American soldiers in Malaysia. Okay. But at the same time, there's no control by force, but there is still power. Okay. In Malaysia, there's no American army, but why are we all speaking American language, American English? Why are we wearing like the Americans? Why are we watching American content? Why are we eating American food? Okay, because we have been controlled according to this via cal culture. So what is culture? Culture is not an easy word to interpret, isn't it? Because it could mean everything. It could mean your habit, it could mean your lifestyle, it can mean your tradition. So culture is actually any form of learned behavior, things that you learn of a particular social social group, okay? What you learn about being African, what you learn about being Malay, that is cal culture. What you learn about being an IUM student or the culture of a postgraduate student, it, it has changed your everyday life, okay? That it has changed your attitude. So that is cal culture, okay? So from the idea of critical theories that says, okay, there is some powerful group that is trying to control the rest, okay, it brings about the idea of cultural studies. Cultural studies is still critical because it also uh, questions the status quo. It also espouses a certain value. 
Okay, remember when discuss here, critical theory, it espouse certain values. Yes, cultural studies also, they espouse certain values. They say yes, okay, the powerful is controlling us. Okay, so we need to challenge this status quo. But the different thing between critical theory and critical cultural theory is that instead of looking that power relations is via transmissional, we discuss also, it believes that this power relations is coming via ritual perspective. Okay, that means we learn about this American content. We learn about how to dress like a Westerners or eat Western food. It's not really just because we watch it on TV. Okay, it's not because you watch the Americans eat pizza, you eat pizza directly. No. Why do we start to like eating pizza? Okay, because okay, the message comes through the ritual. You watch it on TV and then you go and then you see your friends starting to eat pizza. And then you also looked at, for example, okay, you go to a particular place and those people who eat pizza look more happier. Okay, so you learn there are certain meanings that you give to eating, eating pizza. Okay, you may not start. Okay, like I say, I give you an example, nasi lemak. Okay, Abdul Aziz, do you eat nasi lemak? You know, you know nasi lemak? Don't know. Okay, you need to learn. Okay, nasi lemak is Malaysian delicacy. Okay, so the first time, okay, they will tell you, for example, Abdul Aziz just came to Malaysia and I tell you, oh, Abdul Aziz, you must eat nasi lemak. And then Abdul Aziz look at the nasi lemak, he doesn't like it. Because it's rice and it's full of chili. If we're talking transmissional perspective, you will like it straight away. Okay, because I tell you it's good. But through ritual perspective, probably at the first, you don't like it. Because it's against your original culture. Okay, but whether you like that nasi lemak or not can change. You may like it after five years. Or after five years of looking at your roommate eating the food, finally you like it. Okay? But after five years, you like it. After 10 years, you don't like it. Why? Because after 10 years, for example, you have diabetic. You have heart problem. No longer can eat, okay? Fatty or cal cal food full of calories. So your relationship with nasi lemak change. Can you understand? Okay? So this is the idea that is being adopted by the critical culture. Okay, that yes, okay, uh, when, uh, what we call it? The status quo tries to control our, cult, our culture, but our culture will change. And that means the level of control also can, can change. Okay, so I give you examples, more examples, okay? So we talk about culture, we talk about cultural studies. So cultural studies, like I said, it still originates from critical theory. Critical theory. But instead of asking for revolution, saying that the power, that the status quo is controlling everything, they say that they would learn, uh, they will see that the status quo is actually trying to control us via culture. And that culture is more powerful because it can bring about what we call as hegemonic culture. What do we mean by hegemonic culture now? Okay. When we want to study theory, like I said, okay, the theory is always okay, an interpretation or always a mirror of the theorists, those who came up with the theory. Because the theorist, whoever that comes up with the theory, has their own values, have their own belief system. Like those theorists that come up with the idea of positivism. Okay, you have Lazarus Fell, okay, or Laswell. Those people were Americans. They grew up in the industrialization age. They believe in the American values. So that's why when they come up with theories, they say that the theory must be objective. Okay? That the theory can help people perform better. They have a different interpretation. On the other hand, critical theory comes from Marxism. Karl Marx. So they have different concepts, different understand, understanding. Okay, so Marxist, like I've mentioned just now, is a very extreme theory, 
extreme theory because it promotes revolu revolution. Okay? But as you know, history has told us communism wasn't that successful. But the idea of Marxism is still power, powerful. But okay, it cannot be applied in total. So there are a group of people who we consider as neo-Marxism. Neo means new. They are still Marxist. They want to challenge status quo. They don't really believe in capitalism or hierarchical class. But they are not extreme as Karl Marx. They're not really saying, oh, we must have a revolution. Okay? Or that everything is structural. These new Marxists, okay, they believe that power is more subtle. Okay? And the uh, main difference is that the new Marxists believe that everyday people still have power to challenge the status quo. Just now we mentioned critical theory, right? Okay, it only talks about the elites trying to control the people. They don't think that the people is strong enough to challenge the status status quo. But here with neo Marxists, they still believe actually the people can have some kind of power to challenge the status status quo. This is the main di main difference. Can you follow? All right. So this idea of neo Marxists were introduced by a group of German scholars. They are Germans, okay? Hockheimer and Adorno, okay? Frankfurt School. So why are, why are we talking about these Germans? Because they've experienced communism. They've experienced Hitler. So they know that the idea of sameness, communism, revolution, is not really that uh, successful. But at the same time, they can also see the ideas of capitalism being adopted by the Americans are not really, uh, what we call it, ethical or moral. That it is still also a way for these Americans to control the, control the world. Okay? And because the communists, okay, we can say that the communists lost the war, the communists lost to capitalism, okay? So they argue why communist law, communism, was not successful and capitalism was instead successful is because capitalism works via culture. Yes, the Americans, the whites, they control the, uh, what we call it, the economy. They have all the technology and resources. But mostly, according to this neo Marxists, they were more powerful because they used culture. And what we mean culture is Hegemonic culture. What is hegemony? Hegemony is the ability okay, to control. Okay, or hegemony is a person's, for example, our own acceptance of control without challenging the control. What does it mean? Okay, hegemony. Okay. <clears throat> like I said, all right, just now I give you an example. When you come to Malaysia. You see that most of us, okay, our children speak English. And they speak, they try to speak American English. Okay, and then we all dress very fashionably. Okay, in denim, in Western clothes. Okay, and then we eat Western food. You can see McDonald's. Every 500 meter in Malaysia, there's McDonald's. Okay, you go to McDonald's, Masum. Okay, Alia. Probably in Malaysia or in the Gomba area, there is more Mac there are more McDonald's than there are masjid. Okay, how come there are more McDonald's than masjid? Okay, if we take the political economy theory, yes, we can say oh because the Americans, okay, McDonald's is a big company. Okay, they can invest. Okay, they can open up one thousand restaurants in Malaysia, no problem. Okay, but at the same time, why is it that Malaysians or the Malays or all of us, for example, happily go to McDonald's? Okay, because, all right, this is considered as hegemony because we don't realize that McDonald's is actually a representation of control. Okay, what do we mean by control? Okay, 
we say, oh, we're very happy that our children can go eat the burgers. Okay, they can easily eat the nuggets. Yeah. Now, eating burgers and nuggets have become a cult culture. Why do we adopt it easily? Because, okay, our small businesses cannot compete with McDonald's. McDonald's can have drive through McDonald's make my life as a mother very easy. I don't need to go, just drive. And then the McDonald's will give your children toys, right? Okay. And all of these benefits, okay, make you happily accept McDonald's. Okay. But unfortunately, when I accept McDonald's, I am compromising something else. What am I compromising? When I feed my children, okay, McDonald's for breakfast, and they get toys from it, they will want to eat McDonald's every day. Okay? And when they eat McDonald's every day, they are adopting the Western culture because they no longer want to eat local food. They no longer want to eat nasi lemak. Can you follow? All right? They, and when they grow up, Okay, they will teach their children the same thing. Okay, that later on, okay, the Malays in general or in Malaysia, what is the breakfast? The breakfast is burgers. Breakfast is chips and fries. Breakfast is a Western food. It's not their local traditional food. So eating McDonald's is actually a hegemonic culture. Why is it hegemony? It is controlling me. I am compromising my culture. I'm compromising nasi lemak. I'm compromising local coffee so that I can eat McDonald's. Okay? Now, some will say, what's the problem in that? The problem in that is that when we compromise our own culture, we put less value on our culture. McDonald's, 10 ringgit burger, you think it is cheap. But when you eat a local rice, local nasi lemak, and it's only three ringgit, you say it's expensive. Why? Because we put less value in our culture. We see that the Western culture is bad, is better. And when we see that their culture is better, we eat more McDonald's, more McDonald's can open all over the world. What happens is we maintain the status quo. How do we maintain the status quo? Then the McDonald's, the American economy, they will continue to grow. Our own local economy will not grow because we don't support our own eco economy. So that is the control here. The control is via hegemony. I am being controlled, but I, real, I don't realize it. I like it. Okay? I volunteer to go to McDonald's. I volunteer to eat okay, and feed my children McDonald's every day. I happily do it. But I don't realize that what I am doing is maintaining the status, status quo. So according to the neo-Marxist, okay, the critical culturalist, this is how capitalism is very success, successful. It is not by physical force. Okay? Can you imagine, for example, okay, if an American army come to our country and force us, okay, put a gun to our head. You eat the burger. Don't eat your own local food. We would probably retaliate. We would be angry because it is by force. But if it is by culture, we learn by our ritual. We learn because we look at it on television and then we see our children becoming very happy because when they eat the burger, they get the toys it changed our own understanding of the particular burger or particular control by the Amer Americans. So there are many examples of hegemonic, hegemonic culture. <clears throat> the thing with hegemonic culture is that, okay, with hegemony, we adopt a culture that is not ours. We happily do it without realizing that actually we are at lost. Okay, that we are being compromised. That is actually not to our benefit. That when we adopt hegemonic culture, it is benefiting who? Not us, the status quo. And when you talk about the example of McDonald's, 
the Western and American status, status quo. Now, what happens around the world, the status quo will be hamburger and fries, that everybody will eat hamburger and fries. Okay? Everybody from Africa to Middle East, okay, to the Indian subcontinent, everybody eat the same food. So we have been hegemonized. And when we eat McDonald's, okay, then that organization, that Western company will become very successful and this will relate to what we studied just now, political eco economy. And McDonald's will become bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they are bigger, they have more power. More power, power in what sense? Then your own local companies cannot, comp cannot compete. Local companies that sell nasi lemak cannot compete with McDonald's. Why? Because they own the political economy okay, and they control us via culture. Can you understand hegemonic culture? Okay. Like when you go to Starbucks, Coffee Bean. Okay, so how many of you, huh? Shaira, you work at those expensive coffee shops? Okay. You see all these students, okay, sometimes they go and study at these expensive coffee shops, right? Okay, each coffee will cost you 15 ringgit, 20 ringgit. Okay, but we are willing to pay. Although we know that the coffee is expensive. Okay. What is the problem here again? We have assert a certain value to root Western coffee. We are willing to pay 20 ringgit for an American coffee. But when I offer you a local coffee, Sabah coffee, Malaysian coffee, most people will not be willing to pay the same amount of money. Okay? You will pay 1 ringgit, 2 ringgit for local coffee, but you are willing to pay 20 ringgit for American coffee. Why? Well, some people will argue, argue, oh, American coffee have better taste, la, have better value, la, have more quality. All of that are just called hegemonic, hegemonic culture. So we put our own product, our, our, own, our, own, our own culture, we put a set the same value to the imported cup, imported culture. Can you follow so far, hegemony? All right. So capitalism have been quite successful, okay, not quite very successful because of this art, idea of controlling via, cult, via culture. And culture is not just changing our values here, it also is reflected, it also affects or influences other systems, such as politics and economy. So that's why we follow their economic system. We adopt their banking system. Okay. Although we realize that it is not really benefiting us. Okay. The world economy that we are living in is a Western economy. So there is no way, since we are still adopting it, that a particular Asian country or an African country will be able to challenge the American domination. Because we are living within their system. Okay. So I've already discussed political economy. Okay. And then qualitative methods, okay? But all of this, how to study culture? How to measure culture? Okay, it's not as easy, okay, as measuring, okay, people's perception like using survey. Okay, yes, you can try to study culture via survey, but it will not adopt, okay, uh, uh, we call it, it will not be able to capture, okay, what is really happening. Because we already say culture is something that is dynamic, okay? It is via ritual, it change, it changes, okay? So that's why usually critical cultural theory will adopt qualitative methods. Qualitative methods, okay, the main criticism is because it involves a lot of the researcher's own interpretation, okay? I want to study the influence, okay, of American culture on the Africans. But I am a Malaysian. So my interpretation of my research later on will be influenced by my, their, my values. So it wouldn't be object, objective, okay? So while 
this method can help support the ideas of critical and cultural theory. Okay, it has always been criticized by the positivists. Yeah, those people who are scientists, scientific. Yeah, they challenge this idea of critical cultural theory because they say, yes, you say there's this relationship, but you cannot scientifically prove it. Okay? So I gave you the idea of neo-Marxism. Yeah, so neo-Marxism brought upon the idea of critical cult cultural. Yeah? And neo-Marxism, okay, just now they talk about hegemonic culture, and they also talk about the idea of culture industries. Okay, and this relate especially to mass media. Okay, because it says here capitalism or the rich or the elites, okay, they control us, okay, and they control us, they and then they do it via the creation of cultural industries. Basically, they turn everything into, into a culture that can be sold for profit. Okay, what cultural industries? Fashion is a cultural industry. Okay, because they're not really selling us a particular shirt or a particular pants. It's a particular feel good or a particular feeling, right? Why would people buy a very expensive handbag? Okay, and those expensive handbags are usually imported Western produced handbag. Okay. Why won't they be just satisfied wearing a very cheap uh, canvas bag? Because there are values that are being, uh, that comes together with that expensive hat and bag. So here when a handbag producer sells a particular handbag, it's not really just selling a particular product, it's selling also values and culture. Okay, and that capitalism is the cultural industries industry, because what capitalism that sells us are not just products; they are really selling us that values. Okay, what kind of values? Okay, values that define our everyday life. Okay, that what we watch on TV, most of it is telling us to buy things. All right, how to be happy? Okay, being happy is having a house, is having a car, is having some kind of a material, okay, product, okay. So that is why, why is it that they want to make that everything turns into something that can be sold? Because that is the idea of capitalism or Western status quo. Everything must go back to making, ma making money. All right, so cultural industry industries all right okay so i don't want to um confuse you with so much information at one go all right so i think i will stop here okay by now you should be already understanding what we mean by marxism and neo-marxism you must be able to differentiate marxist and critical theory okay they are focusing specifically on big changes and they see people, audiences as all victims. Okay, victims of the status quo who wants to maintain their power, maintain their power. Okay, so they adopt the transmissional perspective. On the other hand, you have the neo-Marxist. Okay, they also talk about the challenge of status quo. They also espouse a certain value just like critical theory but they have a different perspectives in the sense that they say that the power is being controlled, uh, the power is used via culture, via everyday life, which means they see uh, pers their perspective, they see communication as a ritual process. But when we say that communication is a ritual process, we say that communication is always, is dynamic, is changing, it can change, okay? Today, for example, you can be influenced by Western media, but maybe not tomorrow. So, in this sense, we assert that there is some kind of power among the everyday people. That people can challenge their status quo in the status quo in their everyday life. Okay. Alright? 
So I hope you can see the developments from Marxism to neo Marxism. Next class, okay, we go straight to cultural studies. Uh, cultural studies, you will see, okay, it is more subtle. It is not as extreme as critical theory. Okay, it is more, uh, what we call it, sensitive towards the uh, em towards empowering the everyday people. Okay, so that's it. Critical theory. Any questions? Anybody have any issue of to understand this? Okay. Yeah? Uh, uh, one one question. Sure. Um, I think is nowadays the Chinese we cannot label them as uh, socialist or communism anymore because since 1950s they have revolutionized their culture and society as well. Uh, but the Western ideas is that is that they still labeling the Chinese as um, um, uh, socialist and communism. Yeah, communism in terms of belief, but it's not in terms of way of life. And um, uh, based on the uh, Marxism as well, uh, it says that the society is uh, not based on social stratification. But nowadays it seems like the Chinese are. Um, more being stratified there were people like jema be, uh, jack ma become millionaire or billionaire mm -hmm. there are there are lots of chinese who are becoming billionaire affordable to travel around the world uh holding uh, nice handbags and everything investing in many uh, top football clubs uh they have doing uh, many things uh in their life since 1970s when the uh, late president Diao Xiaoping revolutionized the economy and the society. But the uh, Western are not giving them uh, due recognition for the way they have uh, transformed their uh, way of thinking, their way of life and uh, social stratification as well. So what do you think? Do you agree with them, uh, with the Western view up until now or you have your own idea? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jama. All right, that's a very good reflection. Okay, because now we can see that China is the next superpower, and China is the re the only uh, significant challenge to Western uh, hegemony. All right. In one sense, yes. Okay, if we look at the critical theory, okay, yes, the Westerners are being challenged. American status quo is being challenged. Okay. Uh, so this agrees with the idea of okay neo marxism that everyday people can challenge okay the status quo the chinese are doing strong economically okay they are developing very well okay so in that sense yes okay the americans are being affected okay that the status quo is being cha challenged okay but there are also okay people who co who claim China's rise is not really a challenge to status quo. It is not really a challenge to capitalist status quo because what China is doing is not coming up with an alternative system. It means that what China is doing, they are adopting capitalism and they are adopting the status quo. It means okay, that the capitalist status quo, the capitalist system is still there, is still going strong. That the only change is it's from the Americans' hands to the Chinese hands. Okay? You get what I'm saying? I'm saying that basically, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay? From the China, you get the Chinese challenging the American status quo. Yes, that is happening. Okay? But at the same time, there is still criticism coming from the Marxist idea, okay, that the status quo has not really changed. Capitalism is still the status quo. Okay, there is still hierarchical classes, class system. Because what has changed is just from the Americans to the Chinese. But what the Chinese are doing, okay, is still capital, capitalism. It's just that the Chinese have learned, okay, the tricks, okay, the benefits of capitalism. So they have developed their system. They have the new rich billionaires. They have Jack Ma. But when you look at Jack Ma and you look at the Chinese billionaires, they all dress like the Westerners. 
they all eat like the Westerners. That they need to adopt the Western lifestyle because the Western lifestyle is already the status quo. Okay, what I mean is, for example, okay, you don't see okay, Jack Ma's wife going around with a Chong Sam or a Chinese traditional clothes. Okay? So the capitalism, the system is still there and it's still going strong. And now instead of the white person, it's the Chinese person. Okay? And within China itself, okay, they are also experiences, experiencing development, but they are also experiencing all of this criticism against uh, capitalism because you see a very deep hierarchical system in China. You have this group of very rich Chinese and groups of very, very poor Chinese. That means capitalism in itself, if we are taking critical theory, did not really help China as a whole. It helped China to challenge Western and American, uh, what we call it, status quo. But it did not help the particular country or society to develop as a whole because by nature, capitalism is hierarchical. It will benefit the rich and it will leave out the poor. Okay? And we always see stories of rich Chinese. We hardly hear stories of poor Chinese. When actually in China, there are more poor people than rich people. So the criticism against status quo is still very, very strong. Okay? Can you understand? Does, does, does that answer your questions, uh, Jamal? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, that's why... Um, so you can see basically the status quo, all right, it is usually, uh, it's not static, okay? It is moving around. But generally, it will not move in a big change, okay? Okay, when we talk about the, the status quo of white people, Americans, yes, they are changing. But the quick status quo of capitalism, it's still going, going strong. So like I said just now, when we talk about status quo, we must understand it's all about power relate, power relations. It's not necessarily between one ethnic group and another ethnic group. It's not necessarily between the Americans and the Muslims. Even among the Muslims, we have our status quo. Okay, between the Arabs and the rest of the Muslims, there is also some kind of power relate, power relations. Right? Okay. So even as Chinese, the Chinese are taking over the Americans, the power, uh, the what we call it, idea of Marxist, the idea of critical theory is still very strong. Maybe even now more than ever, because what the Chinese are doing is also trying to control. It's just another status quo. Now that the Chinese can challenge the American status quo, what are they trying to do? They try to control the rest of us. They want to maintain the status quo. So it's always about power relation. Who becomes powerful? They want to maintain the status quo. Now the Chinese are becoming powerful. You can see my hand trying to move the balance, the power. Then the Chinese will try to control all of us. Are the Chinese trying to control the control uh, the economy of the world? Because they can offer us cheaper products. Okay? They are starting to offer us alternative instead of using uh, what we call it. Um, Android or iOS, you can use Chinese products, the only alternative, or you can use Huawei, okay? So they are challenging the Americans, they are adopting capitalism, and they will maybe probably become the next economic status quo, and when they are the economic status quo, they will use their power to maintain that status status quo. So that's why the status quo, the power relation is dynamic, it's changing. Okay? All right. Good. Any other questions? Hey, madam, I have a question. Yes, Emily. Okay. I want to confirm something, actually. Is Marx, Marxist theory can challenge political economy? Okay. All right. So actually, political economy is a theory, it is a critical theory, okay? You must understand Marxist, okay? Critical theory, political economy theory, they are all 
under the same category. They are all critical of the status quo. Oh. Okay? So they are all critical of status quo. It's just that the way they explain the relationship. Okay? You have critical theory. Okay? They want to challenge status quo. Very general. But political economy, they say the control is via politics and economy. Whoever controls politics and economy can control all aspects of social life. Okay? On the other hand, Marxists, okay, they say or oh, the control, the status quo is via hierarchical class system. Okay? But they are all critical theory. They all uh, originate from the idea of Marxism. Okay? Oh. Okay. Right. Okay, I hope that's clear to you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, never mind because we will still be discussing this next week, okay? When we talk about cultural studies, okay? Uh, it's very important that you just understand the development, how they change, okay? From critical to cultural. Okay, and another big uh, milestone is next week you need to submit your uh, assignment on the 7th. Okay, so I hope you are doing well with that. Yeah. All right, one last round. Okay. Abdul Aziz, any questions? All good? All right. Hmm. Don't have any question. I'm okay. Okay, all right. Very good. You're okay. How about Alia? I'm okay, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Alice? At least I'm not sure he's still there. Let's not think he left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. All right, Emily, just now. All right, Jamal, Masul. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right, Shaira. Uh, okay. Emily? I'll wait for next class to discuss oh. more. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Then if that is it, okay, we end the class with a speak of Farah and one else. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Salam. Yeah.